Hello, my name is Laura Johnston, and I am the Scientific Associate Director at the Flowcore at the University of Chicago. In this video, I'm going to do my best to give you a step-by-step -step process of how I go about designing a panel for the SciTech Aurora. I do have a shorter video which focuses more on the tools that are used for panel design. It does go into some background information so that you can understand how best to use those tools. But in the shorter video, I don't quite give you the step-by-step -step process. I'll include the link to that shorter video in the YouTube description box if you're interested. There is a lot of overlapping information between these two videos, so you definitely do not need to watch both videos. There are several steps we need to go through in order to get a successful panel. First, we need to gather information about the markers that we want to put in our experiment. Once we've decided on that, then we're going to need to pick fluorophores based on the number of markers we have. Then the third step is probably the most difficult one and possibly why you are watching this video. You need to pair the fluorophores to the markers. There's a lot of strategy in doing that. And I'll talk about the tools that are specific to the Aurora. Finally, it doesn't end there. We do need to test our panel out on actual cells to determine if we were successful in our panel. So I'm not going to talk about this last step in this particular video, but you can find slides on our website and I will work on making a video for that as well. So what exactly is a good panel or a successful panel? A panel is good if you can accurately identify all of the populations within your panel or all of the markers within your panel. I have an example over here where we have B cell markers on the X axis and T cell markers on the Y axis. I'm trying to remove the B cells from my analysis. So you can see for this B cell marker looking in this particular plot, I'm not able to cleanly resolve the B cells from the not B cells because there is an issue with panel design here. And we'll talk about later why exactly this is. Now, in general, there are three main factors that can contribute to poor marker resolution. The first one occurs in all flow cytometry. So this can happen on a conventional flow cytometer or a full spectrum flow cytometer. You definitely never want to pair a low expressed marker with a dim fluorophore. That will always be problematic. Instead, what you want to do is pair your low expressed markers with the brightest fluorophores. That will give you the best resolution of those markers. The other two factors, autofluorescence and spillover spreading error, are more problematic in Aurora panels. And so we need to think about these more carefully when we're designing an Aurora panel. And I will discuss exactly what these are and how they factor into panel design. Before we get to that, I want to go over the information that we need to gather about our markers. There is quite a bit of information that we can acquire about our markers. And you may have trouble getting all of the pieces of information, and that's okay. Just do your best to try to get as much as possible so that your panel design will be easier. The first thing you definitely will need is to decide on what markers are going into your panel. Now you're the expert on your experiment. I can't tell you what markers you have to put in your panel because I don't know your experiment, but I will give you a few questions to ponder while you are making these decisions. Once you have decided on those markers, then we need to know about what those markers are expected to look like. We'll talk about antigen classification, expression level, and co-expression, and these will be really critical for designing your panel. If you have a rough gating strategy, that can also be useful when you are designing your panel. And finally, I want to point out some information about fluorophore availability as well as clones for your markers. Now, when you're trying to decide on what markers go in your panel, I would suggest you think about the number of markers that you want to go in your panel. Specifically, are there markers that you definitely must put in your panel? Or are there a few markers that maybe would be nice to have, but are not totally necessary? You might want to rank your markers in terms of priority before you get to actually pairing them to fluorophores because you might not be able to put all of them in your panel. And if you do have a large number of markers, I would suggest you think about, is it absolutely necessary for them to all be in the same panel? 
So let's say you have 30 markers. You could do two 15 marker panels, or you could do one 30 marker panel. There are pros and cons to both of these. Sometimes it's better to do all of the markers in one panel, and sometimes it's better to split them into two smaller panels. If you split them into two smaller panels, it will be easier for you to set up those panels and run those panels because it'll be a little bit more manageable, but you might have more controls or it might be a little bit more expensive if you have to include the same marker in both panels. With a larger panel, you might benefit with having all of those markers in the same tube when you analyze the data. But again, you have to account for the extra time that it will take to set up that large panel. I also want to comment on the difficulty levels of your panel. So as you make a panel larger, it will always be more difficult. Some people make the mistake thinking that they're trying out this new technology with full spectrum flow cytometry, and they think that it's somehow magical and will make their lives easier. That's not really the case. Any larger panel will always be harder, regardless of whatever technology you're using. Larger panels will always, always, always be more difficult. There's also panel difficulty levels independent of panel size. So let's say you're looking to run a 20 marker panel. For all of the 20 marker panels that you could ever imagine designing, there are easier panels and there are harder panels. So a panel will be easier if you are looking at markers expressed on a variety of cell subtypes. Let's say you're doing an immunophenotyping panel. So you're looking at all of the various immune cells within whole blood. In that scenario, there is a lower number of co-expressed molecules. And because there are less co-expressed molecules, that's going to make it easier for you to design the panel. And you won't have to do too much testing on your actual cells to make sure that that panel is correct. If you are instead looking at a panel that is focused on just one or two cell types, so maybe you just want to look at T cells and you want to subset all of the various T cells within your tissue, this type of panel is much harder because there is a very high number of co-expressed molecules within this panel. And because of this, it's going to be pretty difficult for you to predict things in panel design. So instead of being able to make an educated guess on what makes a good panel, you're just going to have to test it out on cells. And once you've tested out your panel on cells, you might have to spend more time rearranging the panel, testing it out again, rearranging it again, testing it out again. And so more of your time will be spent on actual experiments as opposed to theoretical panel design. You're probably starting to realize that antigen co-expression is very important to understand as you are designing your panel. It's also one of the more challenging things to understand because it's entirely dependent on your specific panel and the cells that you specifically are interested in analyzing. When I try to prepare myself to understand antigen co-expression so that I can appropriately pair my markers with fluorophores, I tend to take two perspectives and ask myself a bunch of questions about the cells I'm interested in looking at. So these first questions apply to thinking about your different populations within your entire tissue. So let's say I'm looking to stay in whole blood, and I can break that into lymphocytes, monocytes, and granulocytes. With those major populations, there are going to be markers in my panel that define them. So I'm going to have markers that are exclusively on lymphocytes, markers that are exclusively on monocytes, and markers that are exclusively on granulocytes. So this helps me identify markers that are not co-expressed. Then I may have markers within my panel that characterize populations. Maybe I'm looking at activation status, or maybe I'm looking at MHC on my cells. In thinking about those different populations, lymphocytes, monocytes, granulocytes, these markers might be widespread across those populations. So MHC, for example, is going to be expressed on my monocytes, but there's also a subset of lymphocytes that express MHC, which are my B cells. This can help me think about markers that are co-expressed. 
A second perspective I take to look at antigen co-expression is to think about the tissue as a whole, regardless of subsetting the cells into different populations. In the entire tissue, thinking about a single marker, is that marker expressed on 1% of the total cells or 50% of the total cells? For example, again, if I'm looking at whole blood, CD45 is going to be expressed on all of my immune cells, or CD3 is going to be expressed on all of my cells of interest if I have a panel that is specifically looking at T cells. Relative to the other markers within my panel, these types of markers may be co-expressed with a large percentage of my markers. However, thinking about markers like FOXP3 or CD25, those are only going to be expressed on a very small number of cells relative to the rest of the cells in the tissue. And so overall, they're not going to be co-expressed with very many markers. So you can see that antigen co-expression is all about perspective. If I'm looking to stain CD3 and I need to think about how I'm going to pair CD3 with a fluorophore based on if it's co-expressed or not co-expressed with other markers in my panel, depends on what my panel is. If I have a T cell panel, 100% of my markers are going to be co-expressed with CD3. However, if I have a myeloid panel, and I'm just including CD3 to gate out and remove the T cells from my panel, then I would pair CD3 with a different fluorophore based on the knowledge that I'm not interested in looking at it. We can also classify our antigens based on the pattern of expression. So there's three classifications, primary, secondary, and tertiary. Primary antigens have a on or off pattern. Here's an example on the x-axis of CD3. So you can see that the CD3 positive cells, they either have this marker or they don't have this marker. There's no in-between. Secondary markers, on the other hand, are more of a continuum, or I tend to call it a smear. So HLADR on the y-axis is an example of this, and you can see there's a wide variety of expression for this marker. Finally, tertiary antigens are your low or unknown expression markers. Hopefully you do not have an entire panel where you have unknown expression, but if you have a small number of unknown markers, then you should be fine designing your panel. Also, just because you don't know the expression of a particular marker doesn't mean that other scientists think that it's unknown. So if you yourself do not know which category your antigen falls into, I would suggest doing a little bit of research and figuring out if it is well described in the literature. You can either check publications or also vendor websites, places that sell antibodies often show example data like this, which can be helpful in determining antigen classification. We also need to think about the antigen density or expression level. Over here, I have a table that describes the actual number of molecules per cell, which I just think is very interesting. You definitely do not need to know this level of detail. What you really just need to know is a general idea of, is it high expressed, low expressed, or unknown? Um, but this is just an interesting piece of information to think about high versus low. Keep in mind, if you have a secondary marker in terms of panel design, this will come in handy when we're trying to decide if we need to pair a bright fluorophore or a dim fluorophore with our marker. I would categorize your secondary markers as low expressors because even though they have both low and high expression, we need to resolve the low expression and that will factor into choosing your fluorophore. I do recommend deciding on a gating strategy before you do panel design. It can be very rough. You don't have to use this when you actually analyze your data. Many of you may choose to go with algorithms like Tisney or Flowsum, um, which you will not need a gating strategy, but it can be useful when you're designing your panel. You can do this a few different ways. You can roughly draw something out, or you can find an example gating strategy in published data, which can be very informative about a lot of information about your markers. One tip I do have 
I like to think 10 steps ahead. So you're planning your panel now, but ultimately your goal is to publish that data, right? And you might think ahead about what figures you might want to put in your manuscript. And maybe for your experiment, there is one plot that you know is going to be incredibly important. You could actually factor that into your panel design and make sure that you assign those super important markers to floor fours that don't have any issues with each other. And that will give you the prettiest plot. So let's say the CD4, CD8 ratio was incredibly important for your paper for whatever reason, then you would put CD4 and CD8 on very distinct floor fours that don't have any spreading into each other. And we'll talk about spreading later on. A few examples, you can sketch a gating strategy out like this, or you can look through published data and find example data like this. And you'll see that this answers some of the previous questions. So I can determine from this gating strategy that I found in a publication, or this is actually my data. You can see that some of the markers are continuum. Some of them are the on off pattern. There is no co-expression between these particular markers. So having a gating strategy can help you answer some of the previous questions. Now that we have all of that information, we can start to transition into picking out fluorophores. This is probably going to be the most time consuming part of panel design. You're going to need to take your markers and figure out for every marker in my panel, what are all of my options that I could purchase fluorophores. There are a few different methods that you could go about this. The one that I tend to go for is the search tool on Fluorofinder and you just type your marker name in here. You can specify flow cytometry, if it's mouse or human, if you wanna narrow down certain vendors, there's more filters that I've cut off here. And then you can figure out which fluorophores you could purchase your antibody in. Keep in mind there are a few fluorophores listed here that are not manufactured in very many antibodies. So there's probably only gonna be one or two antibodies in your entire panel that could possibly be purchased in BV570. So that can be really helpful when you're trying to figure out how to pair the fluorophores and the markers. Also, I would suggest you think about antibody clones. Not all clones are the same. Here are two examples. It's the same marker, same fluorophore, but just different clones. So you can see how different the staining pattern looks for these two clones. It can be really challenging to figure out what clone you should be using. If you're trying to replicate published data, I would definitely try to utilize the same clones from the publication because sometimes it is really important. Or maybe you might want to do a test yourself and figure out if in your particular application, one clone is better than the other. Or if you have some fellow lab members who have done this, definitely talk with them and see if there's a preferred clone for your lab. Now that we have our markers, we need to pick fluorophores for our panel. And to pick the fluorophores, this is where we need to have a little bit better understanding of autofluorescence and spillover spreading air. So I'm gonna give you some background information on these two topics, and this will help us choose our fluorophores better and it will also help us be more successful at pairing our markers to our fluorophores. How does autofluorescence contribute to panel design? Different tissues, different cells have different levels of intrinsic autofluorescence. So really what I suggest you do is before you even get to panel design, take your tissue, an unstained sample, and run it on the Aurora to see what the autofluorescence of your tissue is. Most likely you're going to end up in one of these three categories. So the first category here is simple autofluorescence. So within the entire tissue, there's just a single autofluorescence signature. And overall, this signature is relatively pretty low. In the second category, we still have simple autofluorescence, but we have a relatively high amount of autofluorescence. And the third category, we have complex autofluorescence. That means within the entire tissue, there is more than one autofluorescent signature. And oftentimes different cell subsets within your tissue have different autofluorescent patterns. I find that with complex tissue, at least one of the signatures tends to be on the higher side. So if you are in the second or third category, this is where you definitely need to be thinking about autofluorescence. 
I would suggest making some considerations for panel design, and you will also need to think about it with unmixing. If you're in this first category, then you probably will not need to think about autofluorescence in your panel design, so you can ignore the next couple slides. Now, autofluorescence can be problematic for your panel because sometimes if you have a lot of autofluorescence, it can be difficult to distinguish the autofluorescent signature of your cells from the actual fluorophore signature. Here's a pretty extreme case where I have very highly autofluorescent cells, and then I have B cells stained with BV480. And when I look at these two signatures, I cannot really see a difference between them. The algorithm can probably separate them, but it's really going to struggle with it. Here's how those two signatures overlap. So what you can do if you have a lot of autofluorescence in your sample. So if we have this level, then we probably don't need to make these considerations. But if we have a little bit higher autofluorescence, you might want to be cautious about using certain fluorophores in your panel. You might even decide to avoid fluorophores completely. You'll see that a typical autofluorescence pattern oftentimes has an overarching signature in the UV laser and an overarching signature in the violet laser, and it peaks in the middle of those detector arrays. There are a few fluorophore signatures that also have that similar feature. So Live Dead Blue or Zombie UV is also quite similar. The aqua viability dyes and the yellow viability dyes all have this kind of similar pattern. So I would suggest if you have a lot of autofluorescence in your tissue, avoiding those three colors of viability dyes, they're going to give you some challenges. BV510 and Pacific Orange are also fluorophores that have that similar type of signature, and you may choose to not include those in your panel. Spillover spreading error is a little bit more complicated of a topic, but it was certainly a very important one. All of the tools I will talk about for designing your panel are based on understanding how the spreading error works. So I think it's really important for you to understand this concept. Spillover spreading error looks like this. Some people call it the trumpet effect or the umbrella effect. You've probably seen it in your data before if you've done flow cytometry and you've probably ignored it, which is totally fine. You'll find that on the Aurora, because most people are doing pretty large panels, we need to pay attention to this error much more closely, especially in our panel design. The problem with spillover spreading error is that it can decrease the resolution of your positive population, and that means that your panel is not good, right? So here's an example of a BV785 single stain control. We have our positive population and our negative population. There's not a ton of separation, but I would say there's definitely a distinct positive population. Now, when we added in the rest of the colors within the panel and we tried to look at the same exact plot, you can see that I don't have that nicely defined positive population. This is because one of these other colors that I added into the panel, or maybe more than one of the other colors, spreads into the BV785 channel and causes the loss of resolution. So looking over here, if you can think in multiple dimensions, this spreading error, if we switch the Y axis, that will move the spreading error to the negative population. And that is what is causing this problem here. You may have noticed that I called it spillover spreading error, and you may think that you know what spillover is. I want to make it clear that spillover and spillover spreading error are different. They are definitely related, but they are different things. So I want to go through exactly what spillover is and exactly what spillover spreading error is. So spillover is a concept that we talk a lot about in conventional flow cytometry. Here's a typical spectral viewer plot. We have our detector that we have assigned to AF700 in this blue rectangle here, and we have the emission spectra for APC shown in pink. Clearly, some of the APC emission spectra is going to be picked up by the AF700 detector. So we say that APC spills into the AF700 detector. We also have spillover in spectral cytometry. We just describe it a little bit differently because we don't have one detector assigned to one fluorophore. So spillover really just means that more than one fluorophore is detected in one detector. So as long as we have more than one fluorophore in our panel, we definitely are going to get spillover. 
If we visualize spillover in our actual data, you will see something like this. I've switched the colors, so we have APC Psi 7 on the Y axis, we have PE Psi 7 on the X axis, and this is a single stained control that just has APC Psi 7 in it. Looking at this plot, if we got this data off of a conventional cytometer like a Fortessa, we would say that this plot either has no compensation, it's uncompensated, or it is undercompensated, and that the APC Psi 7 is spilling into the PE Psi 7. We would then apply compensation to this to fix the spillover. So this population would move over here to be in line with the negative population. We could get the same exact plot off of the Aurora. And since we're not doing compensation, we're doing unmixing, we would say that this is undercorrected. Now for the next couple slides, I am going to give you examples for conventional flow cytometry because I think it's a little bit easier to wrap your head around this complicated topic if we're talking about the conventional setup with the one floor four assigned to one detector. But just keep in mind that all of these concepts apply to the Aurora as well. If we were to compensate this plot, Ideally, we would imagine that our data would look something like this. And in reality, sometimes we find that our data instead looks like this. So instead of having this nice tight positive population, we have this more diffuse or variable pattern. And this is the spillover spreading error, or sometimes we just shorten that to spreading or spreading error. You'll notice that the spillover is easily visualized in the uncompensated data whereas the spillover spreading error is easily visualized in the compensated data. I should note that this spillover spreading error is not caused by compensation or unmixing. It is just revealed by the compensation or the unmixing. So some people have asked me, what exactly is this spillover spreading error? Where does it come from? And I read a bunch of highly technical papers and I have basically narrowed it down to the fact that photons are difficult to count. Remember, we're talking about light emission, which is photons. And so our detectors are essentially just counting photons. It can be very difficult to do that. And there's a little bit of error in counting them. And that's why we get variability. It is particularly difficult when the photons come from multiple fluorophores. So if you would like to read more about that topic, here are the references for this particular concept. But what I think is more important for panel design is knowing when spillover spreading error is more likely or less likely to occur. Because panel design will be all about predicting where the spreading error will occur and when it will be problematic and when it will be okay. So I've come up with three rules to go through and we'll talk about how these rules can be applied to your panel design. The first rule is that more spreading error occurs when you have more floor fours in the detector. That translates to the larger the panel, the more spreading error potential you have. So this is why we need to pay attention to spreading error much more on the Aurora. Most people who have jumped over to the Aurora are looking to do very large panels. If you are looking to just do a 10 or 15 marker panel on the Aurora, you're going to have the same amount of spreading error issues as you would doing a 10 or 15 marker panel on a Fortessa. But as we increase the size, we have to pay attention to this spreading error. The second rule is that more spreading error occurs the more a floor four spills into another detector. Don't worry, I will show you a picture on the next slide to better explain exactly what this means. Finally, more spreading error occurs with brighter intensity. This goes back to that original trumpet effect or umbrella effect pattern that I showed you at the beginning. For rule number two, Here's an example that I ran on a Fortessa X20. We're going to be comparing Percy PSI 5.5 with either BUV737 or BUV805. You'll see that there's a lot more overlap with BUV737 than with BUV805. How that looks in the data, we have Percy PSI 5.5 on the X axis, and we're looking at how much that spreads into the Y axis. So you see when there's more overlap, the more it spills into the other detector, there's more spreading error. When there's less overlap, there is less spreading error. 
Now, how do we apply this concept to panel design? If you watched my Aurora training course, I mentioned that we are able to utilize highly overlapping fluorophores in the same panel, but it's not easy to do so. This is the reason why. So if you can imagine APC and AF647, those have significant overlap. That means that we will also get a significant amount of spillover spreading error between those two fluorophores. So I would recommend if you have a smaller panel, if you're looking at 18 markers, 20 markers, you don't have to put these highly overlapping fluorophores into your panel. If you have fluorophores that cannot be distinguished from each other on a conventional flow cytometer, choose one of them and don't put both of them in your panel until you really get into these very, very large panels. If you do have to put these highly overlapping fluorophores into your panel, then we need to be very cautious with our panel design. The third rule is that more spreading air occurs with brighter intensity. Again, this goes back to that trumpet effect or umbrella effect pattern. Aside from panel design, I also think this is a good argument for titrating your reagents. This figure is actually an overlay of four different concentrations of the same antibody. You can see with the highest concentration, we get the most spreading error. So if we can titrate our reagent down and still maintain resolution between the positive population and the negative population, then we're definitely going to be in a better situation for our panel. If we're just looking at this plot, it doesn't really look that terrible if we had this highest concentration of dye. However, we have to remember that this is just one single color and we have a multicolor panel, which means we have the potential for double positive populations. So this is why co-expression is so critical to know for your panel design. And we need to worry about if we are trying to resolve a co-expressed marker, this double positive population. And if we are in this situation where we have a lot of spreading error and it overlaps with this double positive population, we're not going to be able to properly resolve this population. Now that we understand spreading error and how autofluorescence can contribute to choosing fluorophores, I want to talk about the tools that are available to help you choose which fluorophores to put in your panel. SciTech does have a spectrum viewer, which can be found on their website here. And you'll be able to select which configuration of Aurora you have and build a panel of fluorophores. After you have built your panel of fluorophores on their website, then you can click this button for the similarity matrix. And it will give you a pop-up window that looks something like this. Admittedly, this is an old screenshot, so it will look a tiny bit different, but the information is the same. Inside this pop-up window, you will get two things. You will get a similarity matrix and a complexity index. The similarity matrix is the information inside the grid here, and there are values between zero and one. If the value is one, this means that the two fluorophores are perfectly overlapping. You cannot distinguish them on the Aurora. So you will definitely not want to include fluorophore pairings that have a value of one. The example here between PE Dazzle 594 and PE, the value is 0.67. That means that these two fluorophores are 67% similar, whereas PE versus APC is 4% similar. The values between these fluorophore pairings will always remain the same regardless of the fluorophores that you add to this panel. However, the complexity index will give you an overall value, and this value will change based on how many fluorophores or which fluorophores are in your panel. So it's a combined index and your goal is to get a smaller complexity index. It indicates that there's less overall spread in your panel. So there's no target value for you to hit. There's no bad value or good value. It's just that a lower value will be easier. As an example, for a five laser Aurora, I put in some panels just to give you a sense of values that you could achieve. So for 10 colors, you can get a value somewhere around 2.5, 20 colors is 7.3, 26 is 9.3, and then you'll see it jumps at 30 colors all the way up to 29.75. This is the point at which I added in those highly overlapping fluorophores. So at 26 colors, I only chose either APC or AF647, 
Whereas at 30 colors, I had to include both of those floor fours in there. And you can see how much that impacted the overall spread of this panel. An example of how you might choose to use this is also when we are pairing our fluorophores. If you have an 18 marker panel and you've designed the whole thing, all 17 markers have been paired up with 17 fluorophores and your last marker, you're trying to decide between BV711 and BV650 and you don't really have a preference which one to choose, you could put them into this and determine which fluorophore gives you the lower complexity index. Another suggestion I have is to use pre-made panels. So if you look at SciTech's website, they have a variety of different immunophenotyping panels of different sizes. So I think they have a 24 marker panel, a 32 color panel, and they also have published their 40 marker panel. These can be great starting places to just figure out which floor fours to use. So for this 32 color panel, I know that these 32 floor fours work well together. Now we are prepared for the most difficult task of assigning the floor fours to the markers. So again, the basic rule that is always applicable in all flow cytometry, regardless of technology, is you always want to pair your low expressed or unknown, which is your tertiary category of markers, to the brightest floor fours. So here's an example. I've paired my marker TCR gamma delta to a dimmer fluorophore, which is BV510, and I'm not really getting very good resolution. But if I moved it instead to BV421, I definitely get much better resolution of that population. Now, secondary to that, if you have high expressed markers, those can be paired with any fluorophore. You can pair them with bright or dim fluorophores. However, you always want to prioritize this rule here. So when you're designing a larger panel, you are most likely going to run out of bright fluorophores after you have assigned all of your low expressed markers. And so by the time you get to assigning your high expressed markers, then you get the leftover fluorophores, which tend to be the dim fluorophores. Be sure to check out the stain index ranking specifically for your cytometer. So SciTech has provided a brightness index for a variety of fluorophores. You don't necessarily need to use these exact values. So if there is one fluorophore and the next fluorophore is ever so slightly brighter, I wouldn't really factor that into your panel design. I would generally say that the fluorophores over here in this region are brighter, the fluorophores in the middle are intermediate, and the fluorophores on the left side are quite dim. Just generally keep in mind bright or dim fluorophores without paying too much attention to the actual values. Now I'm going to give you a protocol for assigning the fluorochromes. This is adapted from a really nice paper that you can check out that also gives you a step-by-step -step process for Aurora panel design. The first thing you want to do is start with your limiting reagents. If you have any fluorescent proteins that you need to deal with, make a note of those and be sure not to include any fluorophores that are too similar to your fluorescent proteins. If you have markers that are only on one fluorophore or there's very limited options, then be sure to note those. Let's say you have one marker and you're only able to get that marker in PE and there's no chance of moving it, make sure you have noted that. I also mentioned earlier how there are some fluorophores that don't come in very many markers. So you might want to also make note of those and assign those fluorophores. Once you have the limiting reagents assigned, then you can go about assigning the remaining markers. And this is where we do need to pay attention to co-expression. You also do still need to pay attention to assigning the bright fluorophores to low express markers and the dim fluorophores to highly expressed markers. That's always the case. If you have to consider autofluorescence for your markers, keep that in mind. And when you do have co-expression, that's where we need to think about spreading with the fluorophores or how much the fluorophores spill into each other. And I'll show you the tools for assessing that. 
Regarding autofluorescence, a few more tips about how to pair markers and fluorophores. You'll have to assess what your autofluorescence looks like in your unstained tissue, and you might see that more of the autofluorescence is in the UV and violet regions, and there's less autofluorescence in the yellow, green, and red lasers. So if you have a very important marker that you absolutely must have the best possible resolution for, you might want to put that in a fluorophore that peaks in an area of low autofluorescence. One example of that is AF647. I pulled a few other examples. This is not a comprehensive list and it also depends on what your autofluorescence signature looks like but you might want to consider PESI-7 or BV-785, assuming that you don't have autofluorescence in this region. If you have complex tissue with multiple cell types within it, and each cell type has a different autofluorescence signature, you can also be pretty strategic about how you pair your markers and fluorophores. So in whole blood, I have the neutrophil signature here, which is much higher than the lymphocyte signature down here. And again, we have two fluorophores, BV510 and Pacific Orange, that look quite similar to the autofluorescent signature. So what I would not recommend doing is putting BV510 or Pacific Orange on a neutrophil marker because it's going to be much harder to separate the fluorophore from the neutrophil autofluorescent signature. Instead, we can assign these two fluorophores to a lymphocyte marker, and we're going to be more successful at resolving these two signatures. To deal with co-expression, the easiest situation is that if you have two fluorophores that spread into each other, and on the next slide, I will show you the tool that will tell you this information. With these fluorophores that spread into each other, if we can assign these fluorophores to markers that are not co-expressed, then we don't need to worry about spreading error. This marker here is a granulocyte marker, and this is a lymphocyte marker, so we are not expecting there to be a double positive population. It doesn't matter how much spreading error occurs in this direction or how much spreading error occurs in this direction, because we're not looking for that double positive co-expressed population, and it's not supposed to even exist, then we don't need to consider spreading error for these particular fluorophores. Where it becomes difficult is if you are interested in looking at that double positive population. We have the potential for ending up in this situation, and that is problematic. Either you are going to have to predict when you might possibly end up in this situation and try to plan your panel so that you don't end up here, or you're going to have to test your panel out on real cells and determine if you have wound up in this situation or not. To solve this problem, there are two options. Fluorophore 2 is what we call the perpetrator. So fluorophore 2 is spreading into fluorophore 1. And so one solution is to put fluorophore 2 on a marker that is not highly expressed. Then we can imagine that it would be more likely that we would end up in this situation because remember that less intensity is less spreading air. The other option is to deal with fluorophore 1, which is called the victim. So fluorophore 2 is spreading into fluorophore 1. It is receiving the spreading error, so it is the victim in this scenario. What we can try to do is pair fluorophore 1 with a marker that is highly expressed. And so we might end up in this situation knowing that we will expect to have spreading error, but we will hope that the marker can handle the amount of spreading error and we can still resolve our population of interest. This is the spread matrix that is provided by SciTech. I have specifically requested the actual percentage values from SciTech. They don't tend to give these to you unless you request them. You can download this off of our website. How to read this table is that the floor in the row impacts the one in the column. Looking here, we have BUV 737, and when compared to BUV 805, we get a value of 80%. That means that BUV 737 could impact the resolution of whatever marker is on BUV 805 if these two markers are co-expressed. If these markers are not co-expressed, then we can just completely ignore this value. You also have to keep in mind that this table is a tool. It is not definitive. You will not get this much spread in your panel if you design it properly. They created this panel with CD4 as all of your markers. So this is like a worst case scenario and we can use this as a tool.
This table also assumes that all of these markers are in the same tube. This is for 30 markers. So if you only design a 15 marker panel, you're definitely not going to get this level of spread. For more details on how to use this spread matrix, I've actually converted it into something that we call perpetrators and victims. So I'll show you on the next slide. This is an Excel sheet that you can download off of our website, and it just takes all of the information in the spread matrix and presents it in a different way. Based on if the markers are a high or low perpetrator or victim, we can pair markers appropriately. So I have a list of markers that are low perpetrators here, and you want to assign those with frequently expressed markers. That's in regards to the marker within the tissue as a whole. And then for the low victims, we want to think about per each individual cell, how high or low expressed is the marker. And we compare low expressed markers with low victims. So here's what the spreadsheet looks like. You can actually sort it so you can get a ranking of these. It's just counting the boxes in the spread matrix that are above 0%, above 30%, or above 50%. And it also provides some instruction at the bottom here. Now, if you have high perpetrators, these can be very challenging to place because a high perpetrator means that this floor four has the potential to decrease the resolution of a high number of markers within your panel. The first point I will make is that you should avoid assigning these fluorophores to highly and widely expressed markers. One example of that would be CD45. So you definitely do not want to pair CD45 with PE Dazzle 594, which is a high perpetrator. That would be very problematic in your panel. You also need to consider what the goal of your panel is, because depending on what you're interested in looking at, you might assign markers differently. So let's say your panel is focused on CD4 positive T cells, and you have no interest in analyzing CD8 positive T cells. Because of this, you could pair CD8 to PE Dazzle 594 because CD8 will not be co-expressed with any of the cells that you specifically are interested in analyzing. However, if your goal is to look at both CD4 and CD8 positive cells, then you definitely would not want to pair CD8 with PE Dazzle 594. That also means that these high perpetrators are great places for dump channels. Dump channel means that you have more than one antibody with the same fluorophore that will remove all of the cells you are not interested in analyzing. Another option is to assign them to a low expressed or rarely expressed marker. So if you assign it to a marker that on each individual cell has a low amount, then thinking back to how that trumpet effect pattern looks, you might not get as much spreading issues because the molecule is low. Alternatively, if it's only expressed on a few cells within your entire population of cells, it's a rare marker, then you only have to worry about the spreading error on a few cells. And finally, you can assign them to a marker that is on a cell subset that just doesn't co-express with any other markers in the panel. So let's say I'm looking at an immunophenotyping panel, and within this entire immunophenotyping panel, I only have two or three markers that are on neutrophils. So I could put my neutrophil marker on a high perpetrator, knowing that that marker is not going to be co-expressed with any of the other markers in my panel. And a few tips for how to pair markers with fluorophores that are high victims, so they receive a lot of spread. What I would suggest doing is trying to assign these fluorophores with markers that have the on-off pattern. An example of that would be CD3 or CD45. We know with these markers, there is a really good separation between the positive population and the negative population. So even if other fluorophores spread into this fluorophore that we have paired with CD3 or CD45, we know there's so much separation between the positive and negative that these markers should be able to handle some spread and we should still be able to resolve our positive population.
Now, I mentioned back in the beginning of this talk how there are difficult panels. So you're trying to design a T-cell panel for all of the different T-cell subsets, and you have a lot of co-expression, or you're trying to design a NK-cell panel with all of the NK-cell subsets. These tips that I've just given you are going to be a little bit hard. Because you have so much co-expression, it's going to be really difficult for you to fully predict how the spreading error and the resolution of your co-expressed molecules is going to pan out. So what I would suggest doing is focusing on the markers that define your cell type. If you're doing a T-cell panel, all of the markers that define the T-cells and place those on fluorophores that are low perpetrators. Then the rest of the markers, all of those co-expressed markers, you're just going to have to do your best at guessing, but you're probably just going to have to more rely on what fluorophores are available and just stick them in your panel. Then you're going to have to test that panel out on real cells and make changes based on what the actual data looks like. After you have completed your panel by matching up all of the markers to fluorophores, I like to go back to the spread matrix and check the entire panel against the spread matrix as a whole to see if there's anything that I missed. So as an example, I'll explain what I will do with a single marker and then you'll have to repeat that process for every single marker within your panel. Let's say that I put CD3 on BB711. So I'm going to check that against the spread matrix. I'm going to look at the row for BB711. And across the row, where are all the boxes that are pink or red? And what marker does that box correspond to? Then I need to think about co-expression. So for my CD3 example, let's say that we look at BB711 and one of the boxes that has a color is the column for BUV805, and that value in that box between BV711 and BUV805 is 60%. Now we have to worry about what marker we paired with BUV805 relative to the marker paired with BV711. So in our first scenario, we have BUV805 paired with CD19. If this is how our panel is designed, then we don't have to worry about this value of 60% because CD19 and CD3 are not co-expressed, so I can ignore the value. In our second scenario, let's say that we had BUV805 paired with CD4. So CD4 is co-expressed with CD3, and because CD4 is an on-off type marker, it can probably handle a good amount of spread. So we're probably going to be okay in that scenario. And then our final scenario, we have BUV805 paired with CD45RA, which is a secondary marker. It has that continuum of expression. So there are dim positive cells and bright positive cells. In this scenario, since CD45RA is co-expressed with CD3, I might be concerned that there's a possibility that we might lose resolution of the CD45RA dim positive cells. Again, I have to be careful that there's a lot of factors that are going to contribute to what this spread actually looks like. We have to think about the brightness of all the fluorophores within the panel, the level expression of all of the markers in the panel, the number of markers in the panel, it's so hard to predict if this really will be an issue or not. The only thing that I can do is think about probability. Is this more likely to be an issue or is this less likely to be an issue? If this value was 90%, then I would be much more concerned. Once we have identified any problem points within our panel, we have to make a tough call. We have to decide, are we going to keep our panel as is? and move on to the actual panel test and get some actual data to help us determine if our panel is good or not? Or do we need to spend more time on panel design before we move on to the next phase? Keep in mind it is almost impossible to design a perfect panel purely based on theory. 
In order to get to the end goal of good panel design, you're going to have to spend some time in the theoretical design of your panel and some time in the actual testing on your cells. So you can either spend more time with the theoretical and try to do all of the things that I've discussed in this talk, which is pretty challenging to do. And if you spend all of that time, that may mean that you spend less time having to test out your panel on actual cells. So you might actually be able to just do one test, rearrange one or two markers, and do a second test, and now you have the perfect panel. If you spend less time in the theoretical panel design, that just means that you're going to have to spend more time testing out your panel on real cells. So you might have to do several rounds of rearranging your panel based on how actual data looks, but ultimately, if you go through all of these steps, you will achieve a good panel. That brings me to the final step, which is testing out your panel. Again, I have slides on our website that actually go through the process of this, but you need to assess the actual spread within your panel and determine if it's really an issue or not. Here's an example. I actually showed you this plot earlier on and told you that there is an issue with panel design. But as we go through a panel check and assess the spreading error within our panel, we might actually find that this is okay. And if we're doing manual gating, we might actually need to draw our manual gates in a specific way based on the spreading error that exists in our panel. So if I'm trying to separate the B cells from the rest of my cells, this pink population here, I have the B cell markers on the X axis for all of these plots. And on the Y axis here, the first plot, you might want to put it next to CD3. This would be a very popular choice, but you can see that that's not going to let me resolve the B cells cleanly. Based on my panel design, I know that CD16 is causing the spreading error. So if I put my B cell markers against CD16, that's going to give me the cleanest separation of my markers. Or another option, just thinking about what other markers we could use to identify B cells, we can use HLADR, and this would actually be another option where we could cleanly resolve our population. So just because you have issues in resolving your population for one particular plot, you have to remember that your panel is multidimensional and there might be other plots that still allow you to resolve your population. If there are no plots that allow you to resolve your population, then the only way to fix it is to change your panel. So again, if you are looking to get more information on how to actually perform a panel check, you can check out our website and download the slides for how to perform a panel check.